This is, this is, this is. Welcome to it. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Mike Herrera podcast. I appreciate you. Thanks for checking it out. So before we get to all the craziness, let's get into MXPX news. We're going to be in Chicago really soon, Friday the 13th, Saturday the 14th in December. MXPX and the Ataris, two nights at Metro. MXPX.com for those tickets. Ringing in the new year, House of Blues Houston, House of Blues Dallas, two nights in Texas, January 3rd in Houston, January 4th in Dallas. MXPX.com, get your tickets. They're moving, so don't, don't. Tickets, we'll see you there. Can't wait, gonna be awesome. You know Texas is gonna be fun. Can't wait to see my Texas peeps. And Chicago, I've got my puffy jacket ready to go. It's gonna be cold, but it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be great. So I'll see you at the Metro. It's gonna be awesome. MXPX.com for merchandise and all the fun things. We've been doing these live streams lately. It's been a lot of fun. Um, we're, we're just getting into it. This week, we won't be live streaming, but next week, yes. Next week, we'll be there again probably Thursday night. I don't know. It's not always, it's, we're trying to do Thursdays most of the times, but then now and again, something really important happens on a Thursday, like Halloween, uh, at the end of October. So we moved it to Wednesday. So thank you for your, your patience and your excitement about all that stuff. We've been having fun with it. What are we going to get into, Bob? What are we going to get into? I thought I'd read, um, this letter that was sent to us to MXPX. Um, I can't remember if we got it at a show or if we got it mailed to us, but for some reason it was in my hands and I'm like, all right, we're going to read your letter. So Cynthia, we're reading your letter in a second and then we'll get to some voicemails. All right. So thank you. But before I get to the letter, even, I just wanted to say thank you for last week. It was my birthday week. A lot of love. I appreciate everyone. I got some gift cards from, from some friends and everything, some drinks and fun stuff. But my wife got me a jersey. I've been wanting this Seahawks jersey for a long time. I don't have it here to show you, but it's Kenneth Walker III, number nine. My favorite number is number nine. You all know that. So I got a new Seahawks jersey with number nine on it. So woo, go Hawks. I know it's going to be a rough season. That's all right. We're fans anyway. We just we keep on keeping on. So that was cool. Thank you, thank you to Holly, my wife, and the fam. Um, I don't know what my my mom got me or my dad got me because it's my birthday when I'm recording this. Actually, I'm recording this the week a week before, and it is my birthday today. My birthday's not over, so I might have gotten some things that I don't know about yet. Although I'm not expecting anything. Um, one more thing I want to mention: Tom was an esky. <laughs> For those that don't know, Tom. Tom, our guitar player, uh, on our last trip, he was like, he was looking at my toiletry bag and he's like, is that your toiletry bag? What is that? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's my toiletry bag. He's like, you look homeless. And he was kind of right, because I did, but I didn't know it was because of the toiletry bag. But <laughs> so I traditionally have been using a z clear Ziploc bag, like a, like a, bag of a Ziploc bag um, and I just put all my stuff in there and if something happens to it if something spills inside it no big deal just throw it away get a new bag Tom didn't like that so he texted my wife immediately he's like you must get Mike a new bag and he sent me or he sent her a link to what bag she thought I should get which happened to be a matching toiletry bag that matches the exact set of my suitcase luggage my, my luggage that I carry around so now I've got matching curtains and drapes. You never know. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, my wife. Appreciate it. So thanks, everybody that, that sent me so much love on my birthday. I appreciate you so much, more than you know. Uh, I will say, Larry and Shannon from Chicago, shout out to you. Shout out to you because you sent me an amazing gift. Uh, what is it, Portillo's? I think it's called Portello's or Portillo's. It's a, a Chicago-based hot beef place. <laughs> it sounds weird, but it comes in a big box. It's frozen, and you get these hoagies and, and this beef and all these peppers and, and the sauces and stuff, and it's all in this box, and you pull it out, and you put it in your freezer, and when you're ready to go, you heat it up, and it is, it's amazing. He, they've sent it out to me a few years ago, and it's the best. It's so good. 
So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm going to have some of that later this week. Thank you. Larry and Shannon, you're the best. All right, let's get to these voicemails. If you want to be part of this, call in. The number is 360-830-6660. Leave me a voicemail. And of course, if you want to submit your band, your music, if you're an artist and you do music, we do Music Mondays. I'm going to do one of those pretty soon here. I haven't gotten to one in a little bit, so it's piling up. But on the Facebook, the Mike Herrera Facebook private group, that's where you submit a YouTube link, Music Monday. All right. We got that business taken care of. Let's get right to it. Here's a letter that someone sent us. Um, that someone is Cynthia from Las Vegas. So Cynthia says, Dear MXPX, I don't even know where to begin with this, but as soon as I saw Tom's name pop up for a guided tour of the Punk Rock Museum, I knew I had to get a ticket so that I had a chance to tell you my story. I told my dad I wanted this for my birthday, and he swiftly sent money to my account. All right. I now remember where we got this letter. This letter came from Tom. It was given to Tom in Las Vegas a few weeks ago when he was there doing his guided tours at the Punk Rock Museum. All right. Makes sense. Continuing, here we go with the letter. I was 16 years old when Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo came out, and I could never express how much it changed my life. How many times I listened to that CD in, alone in my room? You were the first punk band I ever fell in love with. I had no idea then that I would get to meet you just a few years later. I joined the military after high school at age 17. It wasn't really for me, but I thought I wasn't smart enough for college and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. All I knew was I wanted to get out of the small town in Arizona that I grew up in and the military was a way to do that. I was stationed in Ohio and those few years were some of the best of my life. I was living a double life, airman by day, working for defense finance, punk by night, going to as many shows as I could. I went to Cincinnati, Columbus, and even all the way up to Cleveland for a good show. I started writing for an online magazine, which gave me access to do band interviews and take photos with a press pass and my, uh, and my film camera I had from high school photography class. I still have it now, parentheses. I was able to get on the list at Warp Tour and interviewed Real Big Fish, Goldfinger, and several other bands. I joined your fan club and still have a newsletter and my membership card. One of my favorite memories is seeing you play at the Y100 radio station in Philly in August of 2000. Apparently, you had to win tickets to go. Did you really? Um, I didn't know that, so when I called the radio station and told them I'd be coming from Dayton, Ohio, they put me on the list. It was an acoustic show, and there were very few people there. I will never forget that at the end... Tom leaned down and gave me his pick, which I also still have. That's cool. That's cool. I, I remember, I don't remember this exact show or, or performance, but I remember doing a lot of these and a lot of special, intimate audiences. It was really cool. Um, continuing. I have kept all these things and all these memories. I have loved you all of these years. One other thing I have kept for 25 years was a Left Coast Punk t-shirt with the Poconecha Punk on it. The shirt was blue and the letters were yellow and white. I had lost this shirt for a very long time and it turned out it was just my, at my dad's for 20 years. Finally, one day he said, I have this shirt and I'm going to send it to you. And so he did and I could not believe it had all the, uh, that he had it all those years and kept it in pristine condition. It still looked brand new. I decided I wasn't going to wear it until I saw you play again. It sat in my closet for several more years, and then the day finally came. October 4th, 2024. Day one of Punk and Drublick Fest. I was so happy to be wearing that shirt. I knew it was rare, especially in mint condition, and I knew I would not see another person wearing it. I got compliments all day and even got to tell the story of how I had lost it. It was at my dad's and how he went and sent it to me and everything. I tried so hard to get to the front of the crowd so you could see me in the shirt while you were playing. But I was a few people back. It was great being in that crowd. I felt like a teenager again. That was the show. That was the last show for No Effects. No Effects is last show weekend that we played in San Pedro. We did a whole episode about this right after the show. Uh, Thomas Nesky was on. So if you haven't heard that, check it out. Um, 
Continuing, the next day we went to LA Arts District to have lunch with a friend at the Arts District Brewing uh, Company before heading back home to Las Vegas. We were there for about 90 minutes. Sometime within that time frame, while our car was parked on the street, our window got busted in and the bag we had in the back seat was taken. Oh my God. Of course it was. Of course. I can't believe this. The bag that had the shirt in it. I have been sad and depressed and it has felt like a part of me was stolen. I told my friend that shirt was like my entire youth woven into fabric. This is even my, more symbolic because of the fact that I'm about to turn 43 years old. I felt as shattered as our rear passenger window. Absolutely gutted. I called my dad, told him what happened. He was just focused on our safety and he was glad we were okay. A few days later though, I was on the phone with my dad and we both cried over that shirt. It turns out he was just as devastated as I was over the loss of it. He said he kept it for so long because every time he saw it, he would think of me and he didn't want to let go of that. But then he thought of, I, you know, he thought I should have it. Now he carries the guilt knowing that if he had kept it, we would still have it. That's, you can't think that way. That's not the way life works. You just, you can't ever know what's going to happen. I mean, sometimes you know, but you didn't know you were going to get broken into and that shirt was going to get sold. So don't beat yourself up over that. Continuing. We're getting to the end. He had looked all over eBay trying to find a replacement and couldn't. It wouldn't uh, matter because that shirt was irreplaceable. No other shirt was going to be my shirt. No other shirt had taken my shirt's unique journey. I get that. It was priceless and special and I got to wear it once and it's gone. The worst part is that it, it was a senseless crime and they don't even know what they took from me. They just wanted my bag. They had no idea what was in it and I will wonder what ended up happening to that shirt for the rest of my life. Man, I have a very similar story. I, one, my Chicago Bears shirt, I lost that on tour, and I loved that shirt. It was, I wasn't as much of a fan. I mean, I was a, I was a Seahawks fan back then, but it was more because my dad was, you know? But, uh, <laughs> but, but now it's like, man, that was a cool shirt. Um, almost done. Here we go. So I just wanted to tell, tell this epic tale. I wanted you to know how much I loved you then and love you now and how much I loved that shirt. I figured if there was a chance to get a replacement, it would be directly from you. The more than that, but more than that, I'd just love to hear the story behind the design if there was one. Was it rare? Have you seen many in the last 25 years? Do you still happen to have one in a size L, large, hanging around the storage shed? If not, I understand, but I would love to get another shirt of any kind, and it would mean a lot to me if it came directly from the band. I think that would be the only thing that could take the sting out of not seeing my beloved one ever again. If you have time to respond to this letter, it'd be amazing. We have never visited the PNW and have been on my bucket list for a long time. I would love for my husband to get, get to try some of your beer. I'm not a beer drinker, but I'd, I'd like to try it too. And in parentheses, um, I just love y'all so much. Thank you for taking the time to read this with love and gratitude forever. Cynthia N. Cynthia from Las Vegas, what a heartbreaker. Uh, I'm, I'm so sad that, that you lost that shirt. And to be honest, I have no idea if we have any of those shirts left. I think you're talking about the Left Coast Punk shirt with the Poconacci Punk on the front. It says Left Coast Punk. And on the back, it has MXPX with a number. It could be 11. It could be... 20 it could be 25 it could be nine i don't know what the number is but we had a few different we printed it we printed that twice um the, the original print was probably yeah mid 2000s early late 90s somewhere in there and then we did it again mid 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 2000s probably that's what i'm thinking um long story short I'm going to send you a t-shirt. Now, I'll look and see if we have one of these. I, I kind of just don't think we do because we just don't have a lot of back stock. There's a few things. Like, we might have some some uh, flip-flops for you. <laughs> we might have a few of those. Now, I think uh, I think we've even sold out of our flip-flops that we had for like 10 years. But um, happy birthday to you. It's probably much belated by now. But I hope that somebody could get you this podcast episode so you can hear it. 
Uh, thank you for writing in. I hope you had a great time in Vegas. Thanks for coming to see us at the show in San Pedro with no effects. It was awesome. We're going to send you something, okay? Sending you a t-shirt. Happy birthday. All right, let's get to some voicemails. Let's go. Hey, Mike. Uh, Blake here from Los Angeles calling. Uh, you were asking about Halloween costumes, and uh, I thought I'd share mine from last year since it was uh, punk-themed. But I don't know if you're familiar with the Australian punk band The Chats, but they were playing in Los Angeles uh, on Halloween last year. And so I decided to go as their singer as he appears in their music video for their song Smoko. <laughs> um, and I actually spent a lot of time and actually maybe a little too much money <laughs> trying to seek out the authentic vintage Aussie surf rescue outfit he had on in the video. Uh, but it came together great. I had a great time at the show. The band gave me a shout out and made all kinds of friends. And it was fun enough that I was like, I kind of want to do another punk themed costume this year. And was curious if you had any ideas on something that would be like, you know, sort of timely or just recognizable to people who listen to this kind of music. I was thinking, you know, maybe something no effects related, uh, you know, cause, cause of all that, that went down this year. Or maybe I'll just put on like a fake beard and a ragged denim vest and say I'm Tim Armstrong. I don't know. <laughs> I'm curious if you have any better ideas. Let me know, man. All right. I uh, love the podcast. Love you, man. Bye. Rad, thanks for the call. Sorry I'm playing this after Halloween, but hey, those weeks go by pretty quick. It's like Halloween and then it's gone. You just can't keep up with it. But uh, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to say Fletcher. Fletcher would be a great idea for Halloween because of what happened. You could carry around a smashed up bass guitar, maybe just even just a, a piece of wood that has a little bit of orange on it. Just carry that around and be like, yeah, I just smashed up Mike's bass. Uh, that's my idea. Great call. <laughs> Maybe somebody should do that for this coming this coming Halloween. You got plenty of time to work it out, all right? All right. Next. Hey, Mike. This is Jefferson. Uh, shout out from Oak Harbor, Washington with the island. Um, it seems the, the talk of the, the town here recently is, is Fletcher destroying your base. <laughs> Can you, like, take us through the moments be leading up to it like during it afterwards when he hands you your smashed guitar how did you feel <laughs> what was going on in your head also it seems that there was a fair bit of controversy online um you know fletcher's a cunt fletcher's this or that you know can you kind of weigh in on that like are you mad at him are you not is it more nuanced than that anyway thanks i look forward to, to hearing your answer and listening to the podcast Love MXPX and uh, take care, guys. Amazing. Thanks for the call. Um, Oak Harbor, what up? Shout out Washington. So check it out. I had an episode with Thomas Nesky three or four episodes ago, maybe five episodes at, at, by this point. But right after the show, right after San Pedro, we got on, we talked about it. And I'll kind of give you a, a little, a little uh, update. But... It was a lot of mixed emotions in the moment because so much is going on. You, you know, we're, we're experiencing this this moment uh, in punk rock history that, you know, at least this moment's never going to happen the same way. You know, and all these people together, all these artists, all these fans, all these uh, iconic characters, all together at the same time. It was wild. It was, it was, I don't know, sometimes it felt like, a, in a weird way, a fever dream that, that we were experiencing. But let me take you to the actual moment. Like, leading up to that day, Andy, our, our sound guy, he also does monitors for no effects. He was like, hey, just stay on the other side of the stage from Fletcher. And you know, everybody was joking around, ah, it's going to be great. Because Fletcher's known to just smash things. Um, one of the shows for no effects, he like just completely smashed, he pushed Fat Mike into Smelly's drum set and, and the whole thing got smashed and Fat Mike hurt his side. And, um, that was in Portland, I think night one in Portland. Um, so we just heard that and, and it was like, ah, funny, funny. And so as we go out, we're playing 
we're playing and we're doing our thing on the decline. So they had 40 plus artists out there all playing mostly guitar, some playing bass, including myself, a few playing other instruments, horns. I think JR from Less Than Jake was had a sax up there. He was rocking out. It was awesome. So, but Jay from Bad Religion had his, his, I asked him, hey, is that a good, like, is that like one of your like baby basses? Like, you really like it? And he's like, oh, no, no, this thing's whatever. I just, I just brought this because it was a kind of a junker. To me, it looked really nice. But sure enough, Fletcher was the first one he grabbed was Jay's bass and he starts smashing it everywhere. And I still thought like, I was thinking to myself, all right, Jay's bass is smashed. That's it. That's what he's going to do. I didn't realize he's gonna continue looking for more bases to smash. And so for me, I was a little bit, I, I just was caught off guard in a way, cause I just, in my head, was thinking, I can be right next to him. I was right next to Fletcher, just jamming out with everybody, not thinking that he was gonna try to grab my base. But then he starts looking for more bases. He starts looking at me and I'm like, no, 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 no. And I start going away. And he's like, no, come on, give me, give me that thing. And, uh, I took my bass off, I put it behind me, put it on the ground, and I was like trying to push Fletcher away from me when somebody grabbed the bass and handed it to him. And I tried to grab it again and he goes, he goes, it's a sacrifice, it's a sacrifice. And then that's when I was like, all right. <laughs> and subconsciously in my mind, I was like, if I'm gonna play a bass and it does get, something does happen to it, I'm gonna play my second. So that's why I was playing the orange bass because my turquoise bass is my first, meaning it's the bass that sounds the best, it's set up perfectly for how I play, it's, it's, I'm comfortable with it. The orange bass is newer, so it takes a little longer for a newer bass to become a number one, but it, it, it might have eventually. So that's why I was playing the orange bass because I was just like, just in case. Now, did I think that it was actually gonna happen? No, I didn't think I, my bass was gonna get smashed. But it did, it turns out it was kind of the best thing ever to happen to that bass, um, RIP orange bass. But I got a new one. The next day after that all got smashed, I texted my guy at Ernie Ball and I said, hey, and I sent him a picture <laughs> of Fletcher smashing my bass. And I said, I'm gonna need another orange. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and they made it happen. And I already, you know, I just got it in. But uh, wow, it was it was wild. But so mixed emotions, mixed feelings, mixed thoughts. It went from I didn't think it was even going to happen. I thought, OK, Jay's bass is smashed. I'm good to oh, he wants my bass too. no, no, no to all right, whatever. Remember, it's my second. It's not my first. So have at it. Let him have the bass, he smashed it. I just wish there was more photos and more video. I know there is some photo and video of it, but I feel like there could have been even more. So that's, uh, that's the story. And you know, when it, comes to, when it comes to like people's feelings about Fletcher, whether they hate him or love him, and that's for you. I have no, no problem if you hate Fletcher and I have no problem if you love Fletcher. I personally love Fletcher. He's somebody that you have to be wary of when he's drinking, when he's on something. But during the day, when we're just hanging out, if I'm just hanging out with Fletcher, he's the nicest guy. He's totally cool. He's got ideas. We're not that different, to be honest, me and Fletcher. So I, I love hanging out with the guy and I consider him a friend. And um, someday I'll, I'll get him back. Yeah, someday. All right, moving on. Next voicemail. Hey, what's up, Mike? This is Mike from uh, Central California. Uh, watching your podcast 13th on 13th of Monday, I believe it is, 13th, 14th. Anyways, a uh, few questions, third time calling in. Uh, you did ask, you did answer one of my other questions uh, quite a while back. Anyways, uh, here in the Central Valley, California, there's a... Uh, definitely a little bit of a under underground punk scene going in Espanol. Uh, maybe they're taking the, uh, how do I say it? Um, the torch. And, uh, I was going to see if 
you could help myself and others that are still, you know, fucking around with music. And, uh, you know, I think, I see, uh, legal, law, whatever you want to call it, side of record labels and, uh, the lack of there. And, uh, maybe I'm not asking you to, uh, expose any kind of bullshit, you know, stuff. Uh, just asking maybe you could help myself and others listening, uh, where, where to start, you know? Because I know there's a lot of us out here learning how to record for ourselves. And, uh, anyways, just, uh, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for calling, Mike. Um, if I, I'm not quite sure what your actual question was. It was like, what can we do to do better? Uh, so let me just assume that you just want some advice on how to get going as an artist. Um, if you're Spanish speaking artist, I would, I would definitely go into the Spanish speaking areas of town and, and try to play live for, for those folks. But, um, let's get realistic. You're going to start by making music online. Uh, well, you make it in your bedroom maybe, but <laughs> make the music at home. Um, but put it out yourself, DIY, start, start spreading the word. Um, honestly, I, it kind of, I don't really know what the question is, but let me just make up a question. Um, we're Spanish speaking. I'm a Spanish speaking artist from central California. I'm into the punk scene and I want to know how people starting out can do better. My best advice is find your personality and find out what you love to do and what you love to talk about and talk about that. And if that's punk rock music, if that's the Spanish speaking scene in the punk scene, start talking about that. Start finding problems, start finding solutions, start finding events that you can be part of. Um, you just need to build your community around you locally. I think where we start, as artists is locally. And then now that we have the internet, that locality has changed to being local areas, pockets of the internet. So the punk scene, you know, certain bands, certain communities, 23 punk is a great place to start if you're Spanish speaking, because they're a Spanish speaking punk rock outfit. Uh, you know, they just promote bands and music and ideas and I just think they do it because they love it. So I think just start there. Get online, start talking to people, and maybe start your own podcast about the scene. Podcasts are free. Um, I do actually pay to do this podcast because I, I have a service that I have to pay for. But if you're starting small, you can find services for podcasting that's actually free, where you don't actually have to pay. I don't know what that is exactly, but do your research. Good luck to you, my friend. I hope you, uh, I wish you well, and I hope the best for you. All right, Mike, let's get to one more. Mike, it's your buddy Frank from Florida again. Hope all is well. I did a podcast years ago with my buddy, my best buddy, who's also the former drummer of my band. And for an episode, we explored the genre of cow punk and really found some really cool bands, Jason and the Scorchers being one, and another band called Thin White Rope out of California. I don't know if you ever heard of them. They were around from, I think, about 84 to 92. I would suggest checking out their album Moonhead. It was really a great blend of desert rock, maybe a little stoner rock, some twang in their music, so the cow punk, and even just punk in general. To Neji too. And my, my question to you is, in your time, has there ever been any other bands that maybe you're like, wow, they really should have got more recognition? Because uh, I think that this band, Thin White Rope, for example, should have had more recognition or at least more eyes on them. But it's funny how that happens. So I'm wondering if you ever had any in your experience. One band that comes to mind for me is Goaty Hook. And I saw them open up for you guys in the late 90s. 
Two Years to Never, that album, I thought was a great blend of punk and rock, which at the time I wasn't really aware of. So just curious as to your take about maybe some other bands that you've known, maybe through the Tooth and Nail days, that you're like, wow, they should have been a little bit more than what they were from a popularity standpoint. All right, Mike, be well, man. Bye. Frank, thanks for the call. Um, Cowpunk, yeah. You know what's funny is is my band Tumble Down. If you haven't heard of Tumble Down, you should check them out because that was, I guess, my version of Cowpunk. Um, I remember bands like Rank and File. Steve Kravak told me about Rank and File, and to be honest, I never got into any any bands like the Thin White Rope or or Rank and File or even who are you saying Jesse and the Somethings. Um, I just liked. Hank Williams, straight up country. Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, all the old classic country. I loved that because to me, it reminded me of punk rock. It sounded kind of punk in in some ways. Now, the attitude I thought was punk in a lot of ways. So um, I blended that with what I was already doing with MXPX in the punk scene and, and started doing Tumble Down around... 2007 was when we started, and we haven't we played our last show. Technically, we're still together. We played our last show in 2013. Um, MXPX has been really busy since then. So, uh, but Tumble Down, as an MXPX fan, everybody should know about Tumble Down, even if you don't like it. Um, it's just a little side project that I did for a long time, um, and it, it's got some some party songs. It's a really fun band. It's uh, it's fast and slow. It's got everything, you know. It's got it's got ballads and it's got rippers and you know guitar solos and gang vocal. It's got everything really, but it's not punk. It's like a hybrid version of of cow punk, I guess. Um, there's a lot of bands that I I thought would have been bigger um, over the years, um, especially Tumble Down. But uh, you know, Tumble Down and a lot of bands like Tumble Down came out at a time when the music business was just not doing well, promotions were not good, it was really hard to get any traction, and during those years, I'm thinking 2007 to 2010, 2011, those years were just survival years for a lot of artists and a lot of musicians, and those are good years for us, honestly. We had a great time, lived a good life. Thinking back, I don't know how we survived because <laughs> we didn't do any, we didn't make anything. We didn't make any money. And I don't know how it happened, but somehow we're still here and, and doing better than ever. So um, I think the best advice I can give any artist out there uh, is don't quit. Just keep going, make pivots, change what you're doing, put some different effort into different places, but don't quit. Yeah. All right. Good episode for you. Thank you all so much. And I I just wish nothing but the best for you going into the end of the year. Hope to see you guys out at shows. MXPX is going to be in Chicago. That's right. Friday the 13th and Saturday the 14th at Metro. And then over the New Year's. It's not quite New Year's. It's a little after New Year's, but the 3rd. January 3rd, House of Blues, Houston. January 4th, House of Blues, Dallas. Can't wait for it. We are working on some shows for 2025, so stay tuned for that, all right? Before we go, shout out to Bob McKnight. Much love to you. Producer, great guy. Awesome. Send him some love. Um, and that's about it. Call in 360-830-6660. Peace. <laughs>